students, friends. As late as 2005, archaeologists spoke with certainty about finding the dungeon, or as the Amplified Bible translates it, the cistern mentioned in Jeremiah 38. It was eventually determined to have been built at a later time, but there are many cisterns like that of various sizes in the city of Jerusalem. Some date back as far as 3,000 years ago. There are large ones that were built for the benefit of the general population and smaller ones, some only three or four feet deep that uh, were on private property. I've been in one large one under the city a couple of times, and it strikes me as being an amazing feat of engineering for such, a, such an ancient time because it still holds thousands of gallons of water. Jeremiah was held in a, in a smaller, privately owned cistern that no longer held water. In fact, the record says that he sunk in the mud and, it was, and was unable to escape without help. So he was well qualified to make that statement in chapter 2 about the foolishness of trusting in broken cisterns that can hold no water. He had seen one up close and personal. Generally, the, the smaller cisterns were uh, built in the shape of a pear with a, a smaller opening at the top and the walls sloping inward and upward toward uh, the center, making escape nearly impossible. A lesson from Jeremiah is that a false religious experience or even a broken spiritual relationship can become a death trap like that broken sister. You're just trapped in there and there's no way to get out without help. Years ago, we spent a day in Rome, Italy, and they took us to the Marmotine prison, which dates all the way back to the 7th century BC. And I can imagine it was a miserable place because it's not a pleasant place now. But there was a dungeon beneath the main floor originally built as a cistern, and historians believe that it's an actual place that Peter and Paul were held before their executions, and they have they offer quite a bit of, uh, of evidence to uh, support that conclusion. There was no drainage. It had been rat infested. There was no provision made for sewage disposal or, or the flow of fresh water into the, into the cistern to sit or to lie down to try to get some kind of rest would have necessitated sitting down surrounded by vermin and filth. And those are the types of spiritual conditions that Jeremiah was warning his generation about. All three of those men, Jeremiah and Peter and Paul, were placed in those physical cisterns because of their unflinching stand for the faith. And as we gathered there in the Marmotine prison trying to understand what had been forced on those men of God who were guilty of nothing more than testifying to the truth of the gospel, the best way I can describe it is that there was an awe that fell on us. It was difficult to speak above a whisper. Eventually, I nodded at our worship leader that our session was finished and softly our group joined him in the old song. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Take the whole world. Lord, I've started for the kingdom. There's no turning back, no turning back. It was a powerful and an emotional moment. The truth is that very few Christians in the Western world have ever or will ever be called upon to make such a sacrifice as those men made. For the most part, we've been spared what we might call terrible persecution. I was arrested once for preaching on a mission trip in another country and had a few rocks thrown at me in yet another country. And it was intimidating, but I've never felt my life was in imminent danger because of the gospel. So I, I really can't identify with what Jeremiah and Peter and Paul and several others, or many others, have gone through for the sake of the gospel. But it's more obvious every day that there's an increased pressure being brought to bear on people of faith. Respect for the Bible and for God has slipped to a, a place of disdain and in some circles, outright hostility. So there's some uncertainty as to our place in society in the future. Paul wrote about people who opposed his message. He said, I tell you, even weeping, they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. There are some people that have so set themselves in such a place of animosity against God 
and the things of God that they'll never entertain any other idea about us, the, the evangelical community, other than that we should maintain total silence in every arena. There's, there's no negotiation, no compromise with them. They stop their ears to prevent the, the truth of God from entering their hearing. They hate the faith. They hate people of faith. If they could, they'd annihilate everything pertaining to the Almighty. And to survive spiritually in their arena of influence, our commitment has to be just as real, just as intense, uh, just as uncompromising as theirs. There can be no turning back. It's onward and up, upward. We've made up our mind. We're going forward. We know that behind us is addiction and bitterness and crushed spirits and bewildered minds and broken cisterns that hold no water and dungeons and chains. And to be honest with you folks, it, uh, it clarifies the future for me when I can say emphatically, take this whole world but give me Jesus. It clarifies my place in society and my destiny. You can have the stagnant pools of the broken cisterns. Give me the fresh flowing water of life, the water of his presence. Everything else is a trap. Forward, that's the only way for us. That is the right direction. Listen to